Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of the AR Hardware Show. I'm Ian Cutris, and joining me is my co-host, Sally Ward Foxton. Hello. Read your times. Go read Sally's stuff, it's really quite interesting. <laughs> In this series, we're talking about AO hardware. We're presenting to you over 70 different types of chips and IP for the AI hardware market. Some training, some inference, some that are dead. We'll come to that in a future episode. But I'm ready. You ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Let's go. So first up is a chip that I'm going to talk about called the Enflame Cloud Blazer. Enflame, Onflame, I don't know. It's what it's one of these weird chips that comes out of China, right? They're building a custom GPU-like chip with a very long instruction word architecture, or at least the first version is built that way. A Hot Chips 33 Onflame showcase the DTU 1.0, a 12 nanometer FinFET accelerator with two HBM2 packages, a PCI 4 by 16 interface and 200 gigabyte per second in connects, all on top of a silicon interposer for high-speed bandwidth. Inside the chip are four core clusters with 32 AI compute cores and 40 data transfer engines. The very long instruction word design of the core supports data types from FP32 down to int8, as well as mixed precision calculations. A tensor ALU heavily exploits sparsity, enabling Onflame to skip instructions and data with an asynchronous data flow and compute pipeline. The synchronization happens at the software layer, relying on the compiler for that heavy lifting. For multi-chip servers, up to eight are put into the system, and eight systems can be connected together. Anyone used to a multi-socket Xeon arrangement will be very familiar with the concept of a twisted hypercube. This first generation product has been offered as the Cloudblazer T10 in PCIe, and the Cloudblazer T11 in the OEM form factor with up to 300 watts of power consumption. On flames, internal numbers, showcase that for distributed training over 160 chips, it can achieve an 81% scaling factor. That's quite high. The second generation hardware, DTU 2.0, is already shipping as T20 in PCIe and T21 in OAM, and it's already available claiming to offer multiples of performance, memory bandwidth by using HBM2E, and memory capacity. There's also an i20 PCIe card for inference using scaled down silicon. Publicly, Onflame hasn't spoken about this chip that much, but it has raised 450 US dollars. 450 million US dollars even, more than 450, in funding after Series C investment in August 22. Salience Labs is a British startup working on optical compute chips for AI acceleration. This company is at an early stage having only raised a seed round, but here's a little on what we can expect. As with the other optical compute architectures, Salience encodes its data in the amplitude of light by modulation. But here's where its ideas are a little different to other companies. It doesn't use interferometers to modulate the light. Coherent light isn't needed. Instead, the company uses a phase change material as a compute element, similar to in phase change memory. You encode data onto incoming light, then pass it through the phase change material, which has the weights encoded onto it, which further modulates the light. If we zoom out one level, we can see the architecture looks like a memory array, similar to a compute and memory chip, but the optical equivalent. Overall, Salience says it's simpler than techniques that use interferometers, and the benefits are that you can use really fast signals in the tens of gigahertz. How do you feed data into a chip that clocks much faster than the electronics that's feeding it and still keep it fully utilized? We don't know yet, but we know this is a core part of Salience's IP. While other photonic startups are targeting data center applications and supercomputers, Salience Labs intends to target edge applications that can use the extremely fast latency its technology can provide. This includes 5G infrastructure, robotics, and autonomous driving. I think I'm going to have a lot to say about that in the podcast. I think I want to hear what you've got to say about that in the podcast. <laughs> Tens of gigahertz, right? If, if you don't know, after each one of these episodes, we do say like a 30 minute video podcast. Uh, so check that out. It's going to be the day after this episode goes live. So if you're watching this as it goes out, wait a day and it'll be there. Otherwise, check the playlist probably in the description below. But next up is a chip that I'm going to talk about called Moffat. That's not Moffat, the guy who writes about a Doctor Who. This is Moffat. So a relatively unknown company, Moffett appeared on our lists after they submitted results to the MLPerf database in September 22. According to Crunchbase, this Shenzhen-based US headquartered company has raised tens of millions of dollars in Series A funding and have three AI chips already taped out. These are the S4, the S10, and the S30 accelerators, and they're all available in a PCI form factor. 
Moffett's whole premise is to exploit sparsity in modern machine learning compute. Now, we've mentioned sparsity many times in this series, and it simply boils down to weights and activations in compute being negligible, and gets set to zero as a result. This means a large chunk of the matrix modifications are zeros, leading to no maths, that's maths not math, needing to be done. How you manage that sparsity to improve performance is going to be a critical feature of big models moving forward. Moffett explains in their white paper that you can download on their website that modern GPUs support dense, sparse operations, where one matrix is dense and the other is sparse. Moffett's technology here is built to exploit dual sparsity for up to an 8x or 32x speedup, or in future, they say it claim, 1000x speedup. Moffett's architecture is called Antum, and Antum is in all three of Moffett's chips, again, the S4, the S10, and the S30. The smallest card, S4, has 20 gigabytes of LPDDR4X and runs up to 70 watts, supporting reduced precision formats for inference, such as BF16 and int8. The card supports multiple instances and is explained in the materials as good for video processing. Good for video processing. The middle card, the S10, doubles up the memory to 40 gigs and ups the power to 165 watts, with the aim mostly for data center and telecommunication scenarios. The big S30 adds on another multiple to 60 gigs of memory and 250 watts of maximum power, with the documentation saying it is suitable for life sciences and self-driving vehicles. But it also states that it's still focusing on int8 and BF16 instructions, so it is very much considered an inference play still. Next up, we're coming back to neuromorphic computing. Brainchip were one of the first to release a spiking neural network accelerator. Like Intel OEE and some others, Brainchip's Akita chip is accelerating spiking neural networks, which, as you'll remember, are still AI, but are separate from deep learning, which is what most types of AI are based on today. There are some similarities with Intel OEE. Brainchip is also using asynchronous digital hardware to preserve the timing of the spikes. And like OEE 2, Brainchip uses spikes with a magnitude, as opposed to just a binary one or zero. Because training spiking networks can be hard, Brainchip trains CNNs in the normal way and then they convert those deep learning networks into spiking networks. There's a spiking equivalent of convolution that they use. The result is applications like keyword spotting, voice ID, person detection, basic face recognition, all at ultra low power and very, very fast. Another cool feature is they can also do one shot learning at the edge, which is a quick way to retrain the network, perhaps to recognize new faces, and you only need to show it the new face once. Beyond CNNs, the second gen of Brainchip's IP adds hardware support for transformers, which isn't done in the spiking domain. Brainchip has an eval kit available and plenty of demos of the chip doing everything from recognizing who's driving a car to emotion detection to tasting wine. I can taste wine. So can I. Can I, I be an AI chip? <laughs> can I have a job? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so last chip of this episode from me is the Huawei Ascend 310. Now, despite being under the thumb of the NTC list of the US, Huawei offers both hardware and cloud AI solutions using its Ascend product line. The underlying architecture is derived from Huawei's smartphone solutions and is called DaVinci, pairing dedicated AI acceleration with compute units to enable full application and full stack support. The two main parts of the Ascend family are the inference-focused Ascend 310 and the training-focused Ascend 910. And instead of using a 2D systolic engine like Google's TPUs, the DaVinci architecture core claims to have a 16 by 16 by 16 systolic cube. Sounds awesome. <laughs> Please note, this is not physically a cube, though that would be cool. If that happens, we want to hear about it. Absolutely. On the Ascend 310, it is a small chip coming in at 8 watts, capable of 22 tops of intake. And when it was launched, built on TSMC's 12 nanometer node, it was seen as a potential alternative to NVIDIA's T4 hardware which could be equipped in a server with up to 24 chips providing all-encompassing AI inference compute server-like functionality. The 310 also works for edge services and edge computing, especially with video, as it contains a 16-channel 1080p video decoder block, enabling it for self-driving as well. Huawei compares its performance preferentially to the Halo 8 solution. But the big boy here is the Ascend 910, a supersized 32-core model built for cloud machine, cloud machine learning training tasks. Now, this was built on TSMC's 7 nanometer EUV process. And notice I say was, because we suspect Huawei isn't making any more of these anytime soon. But the architecture was designed to scale up to 512 tops of intake at a board power of 300 watts. This includes the 32 gigs of HBM2E and a 100 gig Rocky connection. But due to the issues around Huawei and HiSilicon, its semiconductor subsidiary, 
and their ability to produce leading edge chips, it's difficult to determine the position of products like Huawei's Ascend, as well as generational improvements that might come from subsequent future hardware. I fully expect Huawei to be drinking its own Kool-Aid internally, but the big question is if anyone else is. Taiwanese startup Neron remains one of the first AI chip startups to get its product out into the market. They launched the first gen chip, the KL520, in May 2019. It's an inference accelerator designed for mass market edge devices, especially IoT and smart home devices. A lot of Neron customers have already gone to market with products based on this chip, in security cameras, smart door locks, smart doorbells, intercoms, and that kind of thing. The KL520 is optimized for image processing models based on convolutional neural networks, CNNs, including but not limited to Neron's own efficient models for facial recognition. It can do 0.3 tops at 0.5 watts, equivalent to 0.6 tops per watt. Typical power is low enough for battery-powered devices. On-chip is Neron's own neural processing unit, alongside two ARM Cortex-M4s, one for system control and one acts as an AI coprocessor. Neron also has the KL530, which is for automotive level 1 and level 2 autonomy, or ADAS. The difference is that the accelerator in the KL530 supports INT4. Switching to INT4 doubles the theoretical tops per watt and doubles video frame rate. Um, they've also reduced boot time by a third. In terms of the accelerator, this chip was one of the first to support Vision Transformer, VIT, the same type of network used for large language models today, but applied to Vision, which is a current trend. There's also a new image signal processor on chip, which can do high dynamic range in 1080p. There'll be two versions of the KL530, one for aftermarket dash cams and parking assist systems, and one for built-in automotive vision systems, making Neron one of the few startups with the automotive qualifications and certifications required in this market. Now, I think one of the issues with some of these small chips is we kind of don't know where they're going to go into. They say automotive and all these things. A lot of people say automotive, but yeah. I'll, like, I'll believe that when I see it. Yeah, frankly. how many actually have agreements exactly. in those systems? Automotive is tough as a market. We'll talk more about that again in the video podcast after this episode. Stay tuned for that. Thank you, Sally. Thank you very much. And stay tuned for an episode of The AI Hardware Show. <laughs>